Hi, I'm Jonathan Oxer, and this is Superhouse. Right from the start of the Sonoff line, from the very first model, they've always used the Espressif ESP8266 or 8285 processor. That's because they use Wi-Fi for their communication. But IT have just brought out this new model. It's a Sonoff Basic ZBR3. It drops Wi-Fi. It doesn't use the Espressif chip anymore. It uses a Texas Instrument chip instead, and it uses Zigbee. So what's that all about? Now, in some ways, Wi-Fi and Zigbee are similar. They both use the 2.4 gigahertz unlicensed spectrum. So they do have a lot of similarities. They're both designed to provide data communication between devices. But they're not really competing standards. They're complementary. They have different design objectives. Wi-Fi is really designed for high throughput. It's used for situations where you might want to stream video or normal internet access. Zigbee is much lower throughput, but it's also much lower power requirement. If you have a laptop with a big battery or a mobile phone, Wi-Fi is fine. But if you have a device that needs to be on a wireless network and run for years on a battery, Wi-Fi just isn't going to cut it. And Zigbee is really designed to meet that need. It's much lower throughput, typically 250 kilobits a second, so like a thousand times slower than your typical Wi-Fi network. But it does have some other advantages. Lower power, but also support for a, a, um, a networking strategy called mesh networking. Wi-Fi uses a star topology. You put in access points and make sure that they cover the entire area where you want devices to have access. The access points themselves use some kind of a backhaul like cable ethernet to link between them. And then your devices each connect to the nearest access point or the one with the best signal. Zigbee supports a topology called mesh networking. With mesh networking, you start with a coordinator and then devices can connect to that coordinator wirelessly just like they would with a Wi-Fi network. But the difference is that unlike access points, you don't need to put coordinators across the entire area. That's because the devices are capable of talking to each other as well. They can pass messages directly between each other. They don't have to go through the coordinator. If you look at this example, you'll see that some of these nodes have multiple devices connecting to them. These need to be powered on constantly because they need to be ready to receive messages and pass them on. These devices are called Zigbee routers. Now a Zigbee router isn't really anything special. It's just a Zigbee node. It's just that it happens to be one that is connected to multiple devices and is ready to pass on messages. These other nodes that are only ever connecting to one thing are Zigbee end devices. Now Zigbee end devices can make use of a deep sleep strategy to really go into a very low power state. They might use only a few microamps, which means you can have a device on a coin cell that can run for several years. So a typical Zigbee network consists of these three device types. The Zigbee end device, which is the lowest power, and that can sleep between activity, and it only ever connects to one other device. Zigbee routers, which are just like Zigbee end devices, except that they require constant power because they have to be ready to pass messages at any time. And the Zigbee coordinator. There is only ever one of these on the network. You can think of it as being like a DHCP server on a normal network. It sets out addresses and keeps everything working together. So it requires constant power and it manages the security for the network. So what does this mean to you? Well, if you have Zigbee devices in your house, having some Sonoff Zigbees could be really useful. That's because they require constant power. They need it to drive whatever load is connected to them. And that means they can act as a Zigbee router. If you've got some Sonoff Zigbees around the place, your end devices like temperature sensors that might run off a coin cell have a router they can connect to and it'll help your overall network be a bit more resilient. Now I have approximately zero Zigbee devices right now. I'm gonna set this up as if I'm starting totally from scratch. I've got an Amazon Echo Plus, which is the new Echo version that has uh, Zigbee built in. This can act as a coordinator. Got a Philips Hue Globe, and we've got the, um, the Sonoff uh, Zigbee. I've plugged in the Echo Plus and turned it on. I've also bound it to my Amazon account, so that's ready to go. Apart from that, it's totally factory. And I put the Hue bulb in here. So I'll just turn it on. Starts up normally. And as far as I know, it should now be in binding mode. So I should be able to say, Alexa, discover devices. Starting discovery. This will take a few moments. Power on your new devices now. And if needed, put them in pairing mode. 
Should already be in pairing mode. Looks like it's discovered it. I found first light, and you can control it by saying, turn off first light. Well, I had to sit and wait for a moment because it had to wait for timeouts in case there were devices that were slow. But now we should be able to say, Alexa, turn off first light. Okay. Alexa, turn on first light. Okay. Well, that was pretty easy. I haven't had to touch it. All the setup was totally voice controlled, apart from plugging in the globe and turning it on. Just tell it to discover the devices, it finds it, and it's done. So, let's uh, hook up that Sonoff Zigbee and see if that works just as easily. But before I hook anything up, I'm going to pull this thing apart. Let's have a look at what we get in the box. Now, the case should just clip apart, same way as other Sonoffs do. Let's see what we can find inside. Very fancy multi-piece shell. Cover over a cover. And there is a somewhat familiar looking Sonoff. From the bottom it looks a bit like a normal Sonoff. You can see the, um, the input and the output side. And we've got uh, neutral pass-through and we've got active controlled by the relay. But apart from that, this electronics is all different. It looks like the power supply is pretty much the same as what they have on other Sonoffs. But the interesting part is right here, and for that we need a microscope. There are a few things that are immediately interesting about this board. Firstly, we can see the processor right here. Now, if I get the lighting at the right angle, we can see it's a CC2530. That's a Texas Instruments chip, which is based on the ancient 8051 architecture. It came out in about 1980, I think. So this brand new device is running a nearly 40 year old processor. Well, some things just keep hanging around. Now if we spin it around so that it's kind of upright the way you would normally look at the, uh, the sign off, we can see some connections. So pin one of the processor is down here, it's rotated 90 degrees. We can see a header along here which looks like a programming header. And you can also see just up here there are a couple of connections that come up through here and this is a tuned circuit for the antenna. We can see it comes up through here and then there is a PCB strip antenna. Meanders along there. You can also see there's a whole row of wires. Now the top of this PCB is a ground plane and these wires essentially stitch the two sides of the PCB together. The ground plane forms a horizontal RF barrier and these wires form a vertical RF barrier that go down through the board and that helps to isolate the circuit here from whatever is going on here and provide a good ground plane for the antenna to reference. So we can see a couple of test points. TP3 is up here. It says it's ground so it's very handy. It, um, it's obviously connected through to the polygon here. There is TP2. We've got the button which uh, turns the sonoff on and off. And we've also got connectors that go through to the bottom board because this is a little subboard that sits on top. We've got four pins here and then another four pins there. Now if we flip this over just for a second, you can see that we've got 3.3 volts here connected to this track. So these two pins here are bringing 3.3 volts up from the bottom board to power this processor board. And you can see that these two pins are connected to the ground plane. So these four connections are all just the low voltage power from the main board, bringing it up to this processor board. Now looking over here, we've got another four connections. And they come through down here onto the bottom board. Now I'll just fix this focus a little bit because this is going to be interesting. And what we can see if we trace from this pin, the track meanders along here and it comes to this transistor and that is connected to the relay just on the other side of the board. That's the relay right there. So whatever pin this goes to on the processor, that's the one that controls the output. We can also see a couple of tracks here that meander along and they come to this not placed footprint so they're not very useful. That's um, I think for RF 
there are obviously some optional features that they haven't populated on this board. So the one we care about is this one right here. Whatever is connected to that pin, that is the one that controls the output. So I'm going to grab my other multimeter probe. I've got continuity test set up here. I'll put that on there and I'll just run it along the CPU. See if we can get a buzz. Oh, there's one. Where is it? Just down here somewhere. There. There, that one. The second pin in. Now remember this is rotated 90 degrees. Now that pin on a CC2530 is... Um, got the data sheet here. It's P0 underscore 7. So P07 is the digital I.O. on this that is driving the relay. And just up here, we've got the switch. Now if we use the handy dandy ground reference, which we've got here, we can see that this side of the switch is connected to ground. And now we can do the same trick. I'll put the probe on here on the other side of the switch. Give it a bit of a run around. Oh, I found something already. Where is it? There, that one. So this one, I could have visually traced it, comes up to the switch. Now according to the data sheet, that is P1 underscore 3. So if you're playing along at home and you want to hack around on this, these pinouts are going to be very useful. Okay, now let's look at this header. Now we can identify visually very easily a couple of interesting things. This one's obviously ground. You can see that it's connected to the polygon. And if I touch this test point over here, yeah, I've got continuity. And we've got, we know we've got 3.3 .3 volts on here. So let's start from there and we'll check whether any of these other pins are 3.3 .3 volts. That one is. So now we've got, on this header, we've got 3.3 .3 volts and we've got ground. Now, where else do these things go? What we can do is do the same trick. I'll just put the probe on there, drag it around the processor, see if we get a buzz. Nothing on there. No. Oh, got it. That one right there. So that pin, which according to the data sheet, is reset. All right, so we've got reset, ground, and 3.3 .3 volts. These are the only two pins we still need to identify. Do the same trick again. Connect onto here, drag it across. Nothing. Drag it around. Do I get a buzz? Nope. What have I missed? I must have not made a good connection as I was searching around here. Oh, here we go. It's, it's that one right there. So fourth one across from the end. And that means that this pin right here that I'm touching with the probe is P2 underscore 1. Now that's interesting because P2 1 on a CC2530 is DD. That's debug data. So this is obviously a debug port, and that means this one is almost certainly debug clock. So I'll do a continuity test on that one. Let's see what we can find. There we go, it's the fourth pin across. That means it is P22, which is debug clock. So now we have the, um, the pin out for this. So this is a debug header. That's what you would use for um, messing around with the source code that's on that processor. So just with a couple of minutes of poking around, looking at things and deducing, you know, just using the data sheet and a multimeter and a microscope, that's really all you need, and a bit of common sense. We figured out all the connections on here. We figured out how it's driving the relay. We found the pinout for the debug connector and we found the antenna and how that little tuned circuit is set up. That gives us a lot of information about how this works. So if you were wanting to hack around and make your own firmware to run on this, and you knew how to do development on an 8051 core, which is a pretty horrible thing to do, I don't want to do it, all the connections are there. You could write your own firmware to run on this. But one thing that is never ever going to run on this is Tasmoda. It's just not going to happen. Totally different processor architecture, and there'd be no point anyway. Tasmoda is designed for managing Wi-Fi devices this runs Zigbee, doesn't have any Wi-Fi hardware on it. So for now, we're going to stick with the stock firmware.
Now if you do pull a Sonoff ZBR3 apart and you want to put it back together, it's one little thing to be careful of. If you look just on here, you'll see that there are some pins sticking up, and on this side there isn't. On the PCB there are guide holes in three of those locations and not in the fourth. So if you try to put this in the wrong way, the board just won't sit down properly and you'll not be able to get the case closed. So make sure you orient it so that the missing pin is in the top right corner, and then it sits down perfectly. Now we can put the cover on, just make sure the button comes through that hole. And drop this on, and input on the left. And it's all good to go. Time to connect it up, test it. I've connected up my standard little Sonoff test rig here. I've got the globe running through, past ground around it. I've got to power this up, and hopefully this is all going to go as smoothly as the... Um, as the hue globe did. So I've just powered it up. It's flashing, which means it's in binding mode. Let's do the usual thing. Alexa, discover devices. Starting discovery. This will take a few moments. Power on your new devices now. And if needed, put them in pairing mode. Oh, well, that's a good sign. It did the same thing as the hue globe did when it was discovered. I think it's gone just as smoothly as the first one. So, Alexa, turn on first plug. Okay. Alexa, turn on first light. Okay. Alexa, turn off first plug. Okay. Once again, totally hands free setup. All I did was power it up, do the auto discovery, and we're sorted. This is looking pretty good so far. Now to really test the ability of the basic setup BR3 to act as a Zigbee router, what I've done is set it up just near the back door. It's a bit hard to see over here. Um, the light is set up there and over near the front door of my house. So right up here, I've got the Philips Hue lamp. This is through about seven walls. It's basically as far as you can get from where I am right here with the Alexa. So there is no way that has coverage from this end of the house. In order for messages to get from here to the, um, the hue at the front of the house, it's going to have to be relayed through the Sonoff here. But we can now say, Alexa, turn on the first plug. Okay. And it's turned on just here. And if we go back to look at the front, Alexa, turn on the first light. Okay. And it's turned on. So we are definitely getting coverage through the, uh, the basic ZBR3, extending the range all the way to the front of the house. So the basic ZBR3 seems to be pretty good as far as Zigbee devices are concerned, but nothing we've done so far is really that interesting from a real DIY point of view. We've plugged the devices in and they've just worked. We don't have any modifications, there's no custom firmware, and even worse than that, it's relying on Amazon's cloud infrastructure to work. And that's a big no-no for me. So if uh, my internet connection goes down, these will stop working because I can't control them through Alexa. But there are ways around that. In a future episode, I'm going to show you how to set up a gateway so that your Zigbee network can connect to your local MQTT broker. And then you can get data from sensors and you can send commands without any reliance on cloud services at all. So in the meantime, go and build something cool.